Yes, please. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to this um, lecture from Dr. Suresh Mukherjee on the uh, anatomy and pathology of central skull base. Uh, and uh, I, I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Vitya Pramjent for helping with organizing this meeting. And uh, so Dr. Uh, Suresh Mukherjee is one of the doyens of uh, neuroradiology. I met him when I was myself uh, just, uh, I was a medical student. He, uh, this was back in the 90s. Uh, he kindly uh, donated a couple of que few questions for the neurosurgery quiz. I used to run on the internet with Dr. David McKellip. So Dr. Mukherjee and I, am, I go back a very long time. And then I met Dr. Mukherjee at the North American Skull Base meeting when I was a uh, intern when I gave a presentation and uh, this was the days of slides and the slide project didn't work and Dr. Mukherjee was uh, one of the chairs and they made my life so easy uh, and uh, I was able to give that lecture a talk without uh, any sort of uh, anxiety although I didn't have any slides so thank you very much for that day Dr. Mukherjee. So now about 28 years later uh, uh, we are now on a webinar in two different continents and um, uh, uh, with your expertise in uh, uh, skull-based surgery, uh, world-renowned, uh, you know, we are really privileged to have you. I think for me, radiology, neuroradiology is like the new anatomy that uh, for a surgeon to go into uh, theater with the, uh, um, with the full appreciation of the radiological features and particularly with the modern high resolution imaging and various modalities, it makes um, uh, operation so much more easier than how it had been before. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, could I please invite you to deliver this um, greatly anticipated lecture? Thank you, sir. Great, um, Niran, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the kind words too. It's, uh, you know, I've been around for a long time and um, it always never ceases to amaze me how things that you can say that they can do in passing are always remembered for so long. So um, thanks for remembering those things. That's very nice of you to mention that. Um, also, I want to give you a, an incredible shout out, if you will. I remember when you started this list server, I think it was 25 years ago when the internet was just starting. Um, it kind of piqued my interest because I think you were the first ones to go online and trying to build this global community of neurosurgeons and skull-based surgeons, et cetera. So um, I've always been impressed by your passion, your passion and your enthusiasm because I know you're, I know you're always online um, and you're always so responsive. But I think what you've done is um, is, is remarkable. So um, thank you um, and thanks for after 28 years. I'm glad we have some imaging <laughs> lectures as well too, which which is which is wonderful. So I'm happy to participate um, as needed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. So for the next uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, what we'll do is that we're going to talk about, uh, again, really focus on the central skull base. We'll talk about the anatomy. Uh, we'll talk about neoplasms. We'll talk about different dysplasias and really just sort of touch on congenital anomalies of the skull base because that in, these are all in a way topics of itself. Um, and I do want to acknowledge some of the schematic illustrations are, I've used are from uh, Elsevier. And then my colleague, Doug Phillips, who is up in Cornell, um, uh, gave me a couple of the slides uh, that I'll be using too. So I, I would do, I do want to acknowledge them. So, you know, when we look at the central skull base, um, and again, I, I live in the world of neuroradiology. I live in the world of head and neck radiology. And skull base, um, as Naren mentioned, you know, we first met at the Nash North American Skull Base Society. So for me as a radiologist, um, to give a skull base lecture really would take me days to do. Because when we look at the skull base, we divide the skull base up into an anterior skull base. We divide it up into a central skull base, a lateral skull base, and a posterior skull base. And actually, I have lectures on all of these. In fact, um, I'll be giving a lecture just really focus on the anterior skull base to another group, um, actually my Indonesian colleagues, not too long. And what we're going to do is really concentrate on the central skull base, but realize the lateral skull base and the posterior skull base are lectures really into themselves. So when you do talk about radiology and when we do talk about neuroradiology and the subset of head and neck radiology, 
and specifically the skull base, really, there's really a lot to learn there. Um, so, you know, down the road, we can try to figure out if you're interested how to, to integrate more of that. So when we look at the central skull base uh, specifically, it really it is primarily comprised of the sphenoid bone. And so when you do look at the sphenoid bone, you know, you can see the anterior clinoid process here. You can see the dorsum cella, you can see the posterior clinoid process. And I'm about to make a really bad joke. So you'll have to, you'll have to just um, forgive me. Um, but, you know, you see the optic nerve right here. You see the optic nerve canal. You can see foramen rotundum. There's a superior and inferior orbital fissure, the foramen ovale, foramen spinosum. So there are a lot of holes in the sphenoid sinus. So we always call this a very religious bone. So I had to throw that joke in, but it's a terrible joke, I know. But the point is, I sort of always remember it because a lot of these foramen of the, the central skull base and the communication of the brain and of the variety of cranial nerves would never be able to make it out to the rest of the body if it really wasn't for the various foramen in the sphenoid bone. And I got to tell you, you know, when I was a when I was a resident, even when I was a fellow, and even as a junior faculty, I found I found the sphenoid bone one of the most challenging bones because when I looked at this, um, especially looking at cross-sectional imaging, and now with cross-sectional imaging, we look at axials, we look at coronals, we look at parasagittals, all the things that are necessary for neurosurgeons and skull base surgeons to go in and operate. You know, we would talk about things like the greater wing of the sphenoid and the lesser wing of the sphenoid and the body and the pterygoid plates and the superior orbital fissure. Um, and especially the wings of the sphenoid, I never really, I never really understood. And then it just dawned on me. So I went back and I looked to our source right now, which unfortunately tends to be Wikipedia. And I, I looked up the entomology of the sphenoid. And the sphenoid is a winged component of the cranium, and it's also wedged. So it's sort of wedged in the central skull base. But one thing it took me about 20 years to realize is that, you know, with me being a radiologist and really being biased on cross-sectional imaging, I was always used to looking at the sphenoid bone on cross-sectional imaging. But I realized that all these bones in the central skull base bones were not named based on radiology you know we as radiologists are biased because we think we cts and mrs have been around forever but these were named long ago you know back in the 16th and 17th century and just occurred to me is that when i looked really long and hard at the sphenoid bone i realized that it sort of looked like a bird and so once i got this bird analogy and realized that the sphenoid bone was named looking on foss i had my eureka moment and once I had my eureka moment, I realized that if I look at this bird right here, all of a sudden I start to see the wings of the sphenoid bone. So this is the greater wing of the sphenoid, and this correlates with the floor of the left middle cranial fossa. And then all of a sudden you can see foramen rotundum, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides going from posterior to anterior. We can see foramen ovale, we can see foramen spinosum. And this all forms that greater wing. And then we have the lesser wing of the sphenoid. And the lesser wing of the sphenoid is really continuous with the plane of the sphenoid bone, which is, which is a planum sphenoid alley. So in green right here, this is our lesser wing of the sphenoid. And lo and behold, we're between this space between the lesser wing and the greater wing, all of a sudden, it just, I was now beautifully able to see the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. So again, all of this is just formed on the various wings of this, of the, of this bird. Now, once you realize that you are looking at a bird, all of a sudden you can see the body of the sphenoid bone. And if the bird has to land, you can now see the feet of the sphenoid bone, which are the lesser and, uh, the, excuse me, the, the greater, uh, the, the, the medial and the lateral pterygoid plate. Sorry about that. So there's our medial pterygoid plate and there's our lateral pterygoid plate. So for those radiologists or the, the neurosurgeons out there, the younger neurosurgeons that have, that sometimes struggle with understanding the various components um, and really getting a better understanding, just remember that sphenoid bone is just like a bird. So when we have development of the sphenoid bone, initially there is a small little gap right here. And this is radiologist, what we would sometimes call it a pseudo fracture. So sometimes if you have pediatric uh, child, children come in and they have little gaps here involving the, the sphenoid bone, this is just the sphenoaccipital synchondrosis. And you can see it here on MR and eventually these fuse. So, you know, as a child, you can see this child is intubated, um, excuse me, has an NG tube, I should say, just realize that that's not a fracture, but that's just a normal sphenooccipital synchondrosis, which goes on to later fuse as you get older. 
So when we talk about the when we do talk about the the central uh, skull base, um, just realize that we're talked about the sphenoid bone, and the next bone that we'll talk about is this bone right here. And this bone is um, sometimes forgotten. And this is an L-shaped bone that's known as the palatine bone. So the palatine bone actually has a vertical component and then it has a flat component. And so when we look at the cross-sectional imaging right here, again, we'll go over a little bit more anatomy of the sphenoid bone. I won't bore you too much, but just realize there's a little foramen right here, which is the foramen of Versalius, which um, contains a small little vessel right here. These are our friends right here, foramen ovale and foramen spinosum. This is the horizontal portion of the carotid canal. And then just medial to it, we can see this little wedged or, or I should say an area of the bone that almost looks like it's torn or lacerated. And this is foramen lacerum. So this is where the carotid uh, canal runs in the roof of foramen lacerum. So the palatine bone is just going to be anterior to this. So this is the palatine bone right here. And this is the pterygoid plates, which are located more posteriorly. So when we look at our cross-sectional imaging, this is part of the pterygoid plates posteriorly. This is part of the palatine bone or just lateral to the palatine bone, which is going to be anteriorly. And this little fossa right here that's located between the pterygoid plates and the palatine bone is the famous pterygopalatine fossa. So when we look at the normal anatomy right here, we can see there's a little foramen right here, which is gonna be the sphenopalatine foramen. We're just off the foramen, but this is where it's gonna be located. And then this is continuous laterally with the pterygopalatine fossa. And as you go out more fearly, this is the pterygomaxillary fissure. So I know it, this sport is not the biggest in the United States, but if you understand sort of the way that I think, and I say, well, it's sphenopalatine foramen, pterygopalatine fossa, pterygomaxillary fissure, this sort of looks like, if you will, the famous Vuvuzela. And I still remember watching the World Cup about 20 years ago. And I remember, I forget where it was, but everyone was blowing Vuvuzelas. And it was one of the most annoying sounds I've ever heard. But as I thought about it, this always helps me remember the normal anatomy of this area. So when we look at the central skull base, we talked about this space right here, posteriorly to the palatine bone, then anterior to the pterygoid plates, which is a pterygopalatine fossa. And then as we start to look at these foramen, we can see that this is V3. This is the uh, Gasserian ganglion, the trigeminal ganglion. You can choose whatever you wish to call it. Just below this is the otic ganglion, and that is connected with V3 as it extends through foramen ovale. And this is foramen ovale right here when we look at the central skull base. We can see this nerve is V2. This runs through foramen ovale, which is going anterior to posterior. And it runs through the roof of the pterygopalatine fossa and then through the, in, uh, inferior, uh, the inferior um, orbital fissure and runs along the floor of the orbit. And then we can see V1. V1 runs along the roof of the uh, orbit itself. So that's our regular anatomy here of that central skull base. And so the first pathology that we'll talk about, and what I want to do is try to make it as, as interactive as I can. Sometimes if you, if you just talk for 15 minutes or an hour, people tend to tune out. And that oftentimes happens to me when I'm lecturing. But what I want to do is, at least in your own mind's eye, if you see something like this, you know, what do you think the pathology is? And then we'll talk about it, then we'll talk about the relative anatomy. So this is a pathology that's involving, you can see here, the sphenopalatine foramen. It's extending medially to involve the, the nasal cavity, extending laterally through the pterygopalatine fossa, and eventually extends laterally through to the, inf, uh, the uh, pterygomaxillary fissure to involve the masticator space. And one thing when you look at this, you can see that it is anteriorly displacing the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And if I told you that this was a 14-year-old male that presents with epistaxis, then you'll be able to jump on the diagnosis, which is juvenile angiofibroma. So in the old days, when we saw something like this, and again, I, I hate to say this, I trained in the last century. Um, I was born in the last century. And when I was training in the last century, I was at the Mass Ioneer and CT was just starting. And the way that this we used to be diagnosed was looking at lateral plane films and looking for something called Homan sign, which is anterior displacement of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. So we would do conventional tomography and we would actually look for widening of the space on, on, uh, on uh, conventional tomography. And in order to secure the diagnosis, we would end up doing a selective angiogram. And we can see this is a selective angiogram of the common carotid artery. 
This is a dilated internal maxillary artery, and you can see the internal maxillary artery supplies this juvenile angiofibroma. Now, when we talk about imaging, I think we're all familiar with the possibility with the pathology of juvenile angiofibroma, but what I really want to emphasize is how do we make the diagnosis based on imaging? Because in general, if I told anyone that there's a, a, an adolescent male, um, and you know, I have to throw this out there too, I, for the women in the audience, what's the upper age limit of an adolescent male? You know, it's supposed to be 16, but my wife claims it's 60. So we can, we can debate that maybe in the discussion. But, but the point is, is that if you do look at anyone that has an adolescent male that comes in, you know, if you say that they had epistaxis, you're always going to jump on the diagnosis of juvenile angiofibroma without even looking at the imaging. But realize that this disease entity that can also arise in adolescent male can also present with nasal stuffiness and epistaxis. So one of these is juvenile angiofibroma, and then one of these is a rhabdomyosarcoma. And the one on the right here is a juvenile angiofibroma. And the reason why I specifically mention this is that notice the black dots here. These are multiple flow voids in the juvenile angiofibroma. This is one of the things that helps you make the diagnosis. You could also see here, if you look at the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, it's a little bit pinched. And again, with the leap of faith, you can actually see the lateral and the medial pterygoid plates and they're intact. So when you look at these, you can see that this tumor is a little bit slow growing. It has um, enhancement and it has multiple flow voids. So this is your juvenile angiofibroma. Now this is without contrast, but I did it without contrast just to emphasize the aggressive bone erosion that's involved in the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And then when you look internally, there's no flow voids. It's very, very bland. So this is your rhabdomyosarcoma. Similarly on CT, we can see there's posterior displacement of the, uh, excuse me, anterior displacement of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus in this case. This is densely enhancing, but this preservation of the bone in the right age group suggests the diagnosis of juvenile angiofibroma. And in this case on the right, we can see very, very aggressive bone erosion. And this happened to be squamous cell carcinoma. So point number one is I want you to be familiar with the standard imaging findings because clinically you're not gonna be able to reliably differentiate between things such as JAF, squamous cell, squamous cell carcinoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. So you have to be familiar because if it's a JAF, you're gonna work this up with some type of angiographic study, where if you think it's rhabdomyosarcoma or squamous cell, you're gonna to have to biopsy that case. One other point about juvenile angiofibromas is that, you know, as we as radiologists were always taught, we as radiologists were always taught that juvenile angiofibromas always had that tripod appearance, that trident appearance where they arise in the sphenopalatine foramen, extended laterally into the uh, pterygo maxillary fissure and medial to the nasal cavity. But this was in another example of juvenile angiofibroma. So juvenile angiofibromas, about 40% of them actually are located within the nasal cavity alone. And I remember this case because I saw this and I thought there's no way it can be a JAF. It's impossible because it's located within the nasal cavity. And so, you know, I jumped up and down, I screamed, I said, it's impossible. And then the pathologist actually came and said, show me the slide. I said, show me the slide. And he showed me the slide. And to be honest with you, I mean, he could be showing like, you know, the leg of a rat on a histologic slide. I had no idea what he was looking at, but he was a nice guy and I believed him. And he actually showed me that this was juvenile angiofibroma. So we did sort of re review our experience when I was at University of Michigan and basically 40% of the JAFs are gonna be located to the nasal cavity. So if you do see an adolescent male that does present with epistaxis and nasal stuffiness and it's just located to the nasal cavity, um, in this case, extending into the nasopharynx, you can still come, this still can be juvenile angiofibroma. So these are some other pathologies that are going to involve the central skull base. So this is a sagittal T1 weighted images. We can give contrast. And this is the same case looking at the axial images. And we can see that this is a heterogeneously enhancing mass that's located in the, the lat right cerebellum pontine angle that's extending laterally into the central skull base and is actually going right into where we'd expect to see the genetic ganglion. And this, on the other hand, was another case in which it's an oblong case that's growing superiorly. You can see it's involved in the masticator space and extending centrally through foramen ovale. 
So both of these are actually examples of schwannoma. So this is a classic trigeminal or fifth nerve schwannoma. And it has this, it does have the uh, snowman appearance, if you will, you, this little waste is caused by it extending through the bony foramen, extending into the um, Meckel's cave. And this on the other hand is growing superiorly along V3 through foramen ovale and extending into the trigeminal ganglia. Now, this image on the right kind of identifies exactly where this is arising from. And part of it is we, we as radiologists, you know, unlike, you know, we don't have the capability to operate on someone as neurosurgeons, but what we do do is that we have the ability to look at the anatomy. And as Naren suggested, the anatomy is so key. So in this case, we can see this mass right here that's involved in the masticator space, but really to the, take it to the next level, you have to understand that anatomy. This is the lateral pterygoid muscle. Just immediately, we have this oval shaped structure, which is V3, which is depicted here on the anatomic slide with the otic ganglion. And as we come immediately, there's one muscle right here and another muscle right here. And these are the Italian muscles we learned about in medical school, but probably forgot. So this lateral muscle is a tensor veli palatini, and this medial muscle is a levator veli palatini, and this is V3. So this V3 schwannoma on the right-hand side is laterally displacing the medial pterygoid muscle and then, excuse me, yes, and then medially displacing the Italian muscles. And when you see this, you can localize it to V3 through the masticator space, and coronally, we can see it's growing up through the central skull base. And if you're going to talk about schwannomas, you should also talk about neurofibromas. So this was an unusual case of a neurofibroma involving V2. So this is the normal course of V2. It runs from posterior to anteriorly. This is it extending through the infraorbital foramen. It's extending posteriorly a lot through the roof of the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, goes through foramen rotundum, and then goes back to the genetic ganglion. And with the leap of faith, you can see this course. So this is going along the floor of the orbit. This is going through the inferior orbital fissure through the pterygopalatine ganglion or the pterygopalatine fossa through foramen rotundum and then back centrally to involve the cisternal portion of the fifth nerve. So a very long course. Now, this is also an example of multiple neurofibromas. Now, if you look closely, we can see two dilated canals on the right and compared to the dilate and normal appearing canals on the left. So when we look at what we should normally see, again, we're looking at that central skull base. So here's our sphenoid sinus. These are the medial and the lateral pterygoid plates. This is the lateral assess of the sphenoid sinus. And what we see here is one nerve out here laterally, that is foramen rotundum. And this is the enlargement of foramen rotundum caused by a neurofibroma involving V2. And if you look medially, we can see the nerve of the Vidian canal. And that Vidian canal is also enlarged in this case. And if you back, go back to your anatomy, remember the nerve of the Vidian canal is formed by two specific nerves. One of these is a deep petrosal nerve, which provides sympathetics along the carotid artery. And the other one is a greater superficial petrosal nerve, which we know anastomoses to the geniculate ganglion, which eventually is associated with the facial nerve. And just for grins here, we can see a little, little canal right here. That's the famous paldovaginal canal, which is located just in the floor of the sphenoid sinus. This, on the other hand, was another neurofibroma. We can see it's involving the pterygopalatine fossa. Again, anatomy is everything. So this neurofibroma was involved in the pterygopalatine fossa. It's extending medially, and it's growing back along Vidian's nerve. And if you don't believe me, just look at the opposite side. We can see a little canal right here. There's our little canal right here. That's involvement of Vidian's nerve. And when we look at the coronal images, there is another neurofibroma involving Vidian's nerve. And this was that neurofibroma involving V2. So there's a lot of anatomy just to be known at the skull base. And so when I talk about the skull base, and Naren asked me, I wanted to be really specific about which portion of the skull base, because there's so much uh, to know. So let's talk about some of the pathology, uh, other pathologies that we'll see, if you will, that's a little bit more classic. So this is a patient that presents with a six nerve palsy. They had a little bit of difficulty swallowing. And what we see is this mass right here involving the uh, skull base. So when we look at the skull base, we can see this aggressive mass right here that appears to have calcifications. So I think those of you that do a fair amount of skull base surgery will probably be able to make the diagnosis that this is a chordoma. 
So a chordoma um, is a malignant tumor that arises from the notochordal remnants. And again, this is one of the thing, the, one of these things that sort of always confused me, because you know, as you know, as a radiologist, when I think of a notochord, I always thought the notochord was actually the spinal cord, but it's not. The notochord is the embryonic precursor to the vertebral body. So the vertebral body extends all the way from the top at the level of the uh, v, uh, of, of C1 and extending all the way to the clivus and then extends all the way inferiorly to the sacrum. So that's why notochords and chordomas typically arise from the ends of the notochord. And when they do arise from the tip of the notochord at the central skull base, they oftentimes present with the cranial nerve six palsy. And we'll talk a lot about that because one of the real foolers that if you're not careful about is that you'll miss the cause of patients that have the six nerve palsy if you don't look very closely. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a few slides about Dorello's canal and so on and so forth. Um, chordomas typically arise in patients between 50 and 60 years old. Now I'm 60 right now. So I, you know, 20 years ago when I first met Naren, I would call this an elderly male. So I don't want you to call anyone that's 60 years old an elderly male. We can call this middle age, if you will, but don't call it elderly or I'll come and find you. Um, and so as I sort of step through these various pathologies, it always fears me a little bit because they typically evolve in that age group in which I'm now part of that demographic. Um, the chordomas can be treated with surgery and also plus or minus proton beam. And maybe that's something we, we can discuss in our Q&A session because I know when I was a, a, a resident, I did my resident at the Harvard system at the Brigham, um, right across the street at the Mass General, we had the only proton beam scanner. I know a lot of people were being referred to for proton beam. I'm still kind of curious after a 30 years experience as to, to how beneficial proton beam is for either treatment or, or reduction of growth of chordomas. Now, chordomas um, have a bit of a discordancy when you look at imaging. So this is an example of the classical appearance of a chordoma and notice how it's high signal on T2. So when you look at this, you can say, wow, is this fluid? Is it a mucosal or so on and so forth? But when we look, and it doesn't necessarily look solid, but when we give contrast, we can see that this is a solid and a very aggressively enhancing mass. So this is that discrepancy that you can see in chordomas. And it's due to the fact that chordomas contain these unique cells that are called fissiliferous cells that contain mucin and glycogen. So even though they are solid, this gives you this large, this almost uh, fluid, not necessarily a fluid appearance, but a mucoid appearance. So it can be a bit confusing at times. So always remember to look at the, um, the uh, contrast enhanced images to make sure it's solid. Now, later on, we're gonna talk about a, a tumor that can have a similar appearance to this that can involve the clivus. And I just wanna point out that chordomas have high T2 signal, because as you'll see in a few slides, that can help you differentiate this from a different type of tumor. Now, chordomas, again, another example, high signal on T2, they can enhance with contrast. This just happens to be a diffusion tensor imaging with the various fiber tracks. And the only reason I show this, you may or may not be doing this routinely, but it demonstrates and notice these fiber tracks are in green and purple and red. Notice that they really are not extending through the chordoma. And this just demonstrates that the chordomas tend to push the fiber tracks through the sides as opposed to these fiber tracks actually running in the chordoma. So it truly is an extra axial lesion. Now chordomas can arise anywhere along the course of the notochord, as I mentioned, and sometimes they can actually involve the cella. So this happens to be a cellar and supercellar's chordoma, expanding the cella, extending through the diaphragm at cella into the supercellar cistern. And we can see that the mass effect that it's having on the optic chiasm. And for all the world, I probably would have called that a pituitary adenoma, but this just happens to be an ectopic chordoma rising in the cella. Now you can also have other types of notochordal remnants. So this is an example of something that we oftentimes see on cross-sectional imaging. And again, be, me being a head and neck radiologist and a skull-based radiologist, what I uh, oftentimes will see this that's located in the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity. So we have a focal area here that's high T1 signal that's below the mucosa. So this is a submucosal lesion. It's arising between these two muscles, which is the longus coli muscles within this little pharyngeal bursa. And so if ever any of the radiologists on this talk, they can already figured out this diagnosis. This is a little notochordal remnant, and this is called the torn wall cyst. <laughs> 
So if you will, this is an anterior notochordal remnant that's involved in the pharyngeal bursa. Now this on the other hand is something that you may see again if you're looking at uh, CTs or MRs, what we see here is a little scalloped appearance of the bone involved in the dorsal aspect of the clivus. And when you look at this, you're saying, hmm, what is that? Is that an erosive region? Is it just some bone irregularity? But if you do the T2-weighted images, lo and behold, we can see it's high T2 signal. And then we look at the sagittal images, again, we can see it's actually solid. So all of a sudden here, we have a skull-based lesion involved in the dorsal clivus that has very similar signal characteristics to a chordoma. And in fact, this is not necessarily a chordoma. Now, could this be the smallest chordoma in the world? Yeah, it, I assume it could be. But in general, we attribute this to this disease, which is echordosis fissilifera. And again, this is another nodal chordal remnant. Unlike the torn wall cyst, which is anteriorly, this tends to be posteriorly, and it has this classic location along the dorsal aspect of the clivus. Now, chordomas can also be, again, extra osseous. Now, when, you, when I looked and I was reviewing this, you can have small little fibers embryonically, em embryologically extending anteriorly from the vertebral bodies. So occasionally you can get these small little extra osseous chordomas and they can be a bit of a fooler. In fact, we just published one case uh, very recently and for all the world, I thought it was gonna be a neurofibroma because it had this close attachment and you can see the scalloping here involved in the anterior margins and we can see that it's solid. But really the only way to, to, to reliably make this diagnosis is to think of it. So if you do see this mass involving, a submucosal mass involving the pharynx, you just have to remember it's high T2 signal and it's solid, and then you can at least include in the differential diagnosis. I'm not sure how certain you can be to, uh, for sure, because you can have a lot of pathology involving the oropharynx, but in the back of your mind, if you have something that is associated with scalloping of the vertebral bodies and maybe extending a little bit more posteriorly, you can suggest a diagnosis of that extra osseous chordoma. So the next common pathology that we'll talk about involving the central skull base <clears throat> is typically these lesions that arise from the petroclival fissure. So the chordoma is tended to be centrally, but laterally we can sometimes see these lesions arising from the sphenooccipital, excuse me, the petroclival fissure, and they are solid masses that are oftentimes associated with this dystrophic calcification. And it can have a variable appearance. This was a, has a little bit of an aggressive margin along the jugular frame, and this is certainly an atypical appearance. And this is a little bit more what you would see. Again, a sort of a bony chondroid lesion arising from that's paramidline. Now, my musculoskeletal radiologist would tell me that these look like rings and circles. This does not look like rings and circles to me, but that's what my MSK radiologist tell me. But the bottom line is that if you do see an aggressive lesion that's paramidline, you have to think of the chondrosarcomas. So as I mentioned before, you can have these rings and circles that are paramidline, and this is more of the classical appearance to a chondrosarcoma, but realize they can be different appearances, and I'll show those especially on MR. So chondrosarcomas, again, malignant lesions arise between 40 and 50 years old. Um, they tend to arise from that petroclival fissure along the synchondrosis. Now, one thing that I do want to emphasize about chondrosarcomas is that there are different histologic types of chondrosarcoma. So you can have myelin, you can have myxoids, you can have clear cells. And the reason why I mention this is that nothing is 100% on imaging. So as we start to look at the MR findings of chondrosarcomas, you'll see that there's going to be an overlap with chordomas, and you're also going to see a variable appearance of chondrosarcomas on MR. So here is an example of a chondrosarcoma. And for all the world, this looks like the same imaging features associated with the chordoma. And quite frankly, it is. You know, if I saw this, I would probably just favor chondrosarcoma given the fact that it's paramidline, it's high T2 signal, it's low signal on T1 and homogeneously enhances. And just for grins right here, we follow this out laterally. Here's our clivus. And you can see this little frame in right here. This just happens to be the hypoglossal canal. So in this particular case, this chondrosarcoma presented with the 12th nerve palsy, not necessarily a sixth nerve palsy. And again, from an imaging standpoint, it's hard to differentiate between a chordoma, but we can suggest it based on the midline approach. Another example here of a chondrosarcoma, this is patient number one, and this is patient number two. 
I juxtapose these in the sense that the chondrosarcomas on T2, uh, in this case, both tend to be high signal, but I do wanna point out the enhancement. So this is a T1 weighted image with contrast. Notice this chondrosarcoma is avidly enhancing, whereas this chondrosarcoma has heterogeneous enhancement. Now, this is something, a technique that you're probably using. This is the DWI, the diffusion weighted sequences. I find the DWI, we always do it. Um, and there's a lot of literature out there that says it's helpful. But what I would say, it's, 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 I don't think it's as re reliable as been reported in the literature. And especially for trying to say how aggressive a chondrosarcoma is. <clears throat> because in general, if someone, something has high DWI signal and low ADC, well, then it more really suggests a more aggressive lesion. But just realize when you do DWI, it's there's a lot of artifact associated in the skull base. And sometimes the data that you get is not as reliable, as clear cut as you would see if it was done in other parts of the body, such as the brain, because the brain really is like a nice bag of jello. So you have a very, you can get a nice homogeneous signal within the brain. Once you get to that skull base, you know, if you have a big lesion, it can be helpful. But just realize the artifacts associated with diffusion weighted imaging are based on the bone, it's based on the air and based on the vessels for which we all have a lot of at the skull base. So therefore the DWI signal may not be as reliable as has felt to believe. So here's another case that's gonna involve that central skull base. And it makes a couple of points. Uh, again, I, I really wanna emphasize, and that's why I'm glad I have a, I have a chance to, um, to talk to everyone. Uh, so <clears throat> one thing that I, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the chat box and I see people calling from all over the world, which is fantastic. So welcome to everyone. So this is a, a patient that presented with um, a mass involving the right orbit. And notice on the bone, on the regular soft tissue windows, maybe with a leap of faith, there's a little bit expansion. And one of the things that I always emphasize doing, especially when you're looking at the skull base, is take your regular data and then reconvert it into bone algorithms. And when you do the bone algorithms, all of a sudden you see this speculated mass and that's an intraosseous mass involving the greater, the lesser wing and the greater wing of the sphenoid. And when you see this, all of a sudden you can come up or suggest a proper diagnosis. The next thing is that when you do your MR studies, just make sure you do really thin section imaging. One of the biggest pitfalls I see is that people are working on patients with cranial nerve palsies <clears throat> and they're just doing standard imaging. You really do need to do dedicated imaging in order to see some of the anatomy that we talked about below before. So on the non-contrast T1-weighted images, we can see enlargement of the right greater wing of the sphenoid. On the contrast enhanced T1-weighted image, <clears throat> we can see this enhancing mass. And with the leap of faith, we almost get the impression that there's a dural tail extending out of it. And on the T2-weighted images, we can see it's very dark. So this, in fact, is an example of a meningioma involving the greater wing of the sphenoid. Now, these patients oftentimes present with visual nerve, um, excuse me, with um, vision problems, and it could be due to sometimes compression of the superior orbital vein. It can be comp uh, due to compression of the, optic, uh, of the optic nerve as it extends through the optic canal, or potentially sometimes because it's involving the superior orbital fissure involving cranial nerves three through six. Now, the only way you can really differentiate those two is to do thin section dedicated skull base imaging, because if you perform a brain imaging, you're just not gonna have the clarity of those small little anatomic structures. Now, the other thing that this could be is metastases. And if you were a child, if this was a child, then you'd have to think of things such as metastatic neuroblastoma or metastatic Ewing sarcoma. But in an adult, the top two things that give you this appearance are gonna be meningioma and metastases. So when we do do meningiomas, again, they emphasize the fact of doing very thin cross-sectional imaging to look at that anatomy. Notice how this meningioma, we can all make the diagnosis, but notice how this meningioma is extending anteriorly into the cavernous sinus. Look on the right side here, we can see the normal appearance of the carotid artery. On the left-hand side, we can see that carotid artery is narrowing, so clearly it's encased. This is a T1-weighted imaging of Meckel's cave. And on the T2, we can see the high signal of Meckel's cave. We can see, don't see Meckel's cave on the left-hand side, and we can see replacement at the signal um, on, the, on the ipsilateral Meckel's cave. So this tells you that we're doing with frank cavernous sinus invasion. <clears throat> 
And remember all of this anatomy, once we're in the carotid artery, we can see cranial six just inferior to it. And then we can see three, four, V1 and V2 along the walls. And in this case, we can see that meningioma is completely encasing the cavernous sinus. And really to get through this anatomy alone, you probably figured out how much I love skull-based imaging. This really is a talk into itself in order to really map out all of those uh, small little nerves. Now, one thing about meningiomas that I've learned over my, my uh, life, there's a saying by Will Rogers that says, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to have experience. One thing I have noticed is that occasionally I have seen these masticator space masses turn out to be meningiomas. And the reason is, is that those meninges uh, line the floor of the middle cranial fossa. And sometimes when you do have interosseous meningiomas like this, they can extend inferiorly. And we always think a meningioma is extending superiorly. But just remember, you can have interosseous meningiomas that can extend inferiorly into the masticator space. So again, if you have these masses, take a really close look at the skull base. Uh, make sure that if you see masses like this, what is that relationship? Is it purely below the skull base? or is extending into the middle cranial fossa, and you could be actually dealing with, with an inferior growing meningioma. So the way that you can make the diagnosis in this case is just knowing that it's a child. So we have a large mass right here that's involved in the skull base. We can see that it's densely enhancing, and this just happens to be a rhabdomyosarcoma. This could be a variety of different pathologies, especially in adult. But remember, rhabdomyosarcomas is the most common soft tissue sarcoma in children. They typically arise before the age of 12 years old. And again, similarly, they can have a variety of different histological components that give you the variable enhancement pattern that we see on MR. So this is an example of a rhabdomyosarcoma involving the nasopharynx. Now, one thing here that tips us off that this is ominous is I want you to point right here. This is unilateral mucosal thickening involving the mastoid air cells. And if you are an ENT surgeon on this phone call or a skull base surgeon, you know, anytime you have a patient that presents with unilateral serous otitis media and you look at an MR and you see this ipsilateral uh, thickening, you always have to worry about something that's involved in the eustachian tube. And remember that eustachian tube is continuous with the lateral uh, skull base through the protympanum. So anything that sort of compresses that eustachian tube is going to give you that serous otitis media. Another example of a rhabdomyosarcoma, this was involved in the skull base. Look what it's doing to the skull base. Notice how there's frank erosion of the skull base. If you don't believe me, look at the opposite side. This is the normal foramen valley on the right. This is completely eroded the middle cranial fossa, again, extending into the cavernous sinus. And again, another example of a re aggressive rhabdomyosarcoma involving the clivus, given the high DWI signal, which is indicative of a very densely cellular mass. <clears throat> now we'll move on to the, uh, again, it's a few lesions that are involving that central skull base. I think we'll all make the diagnosis here. This is a, a mass here that's involving the, the, the central skull base, expanding the cella, going through the diaphragmic cella, extending into the supracellular cistern and abutting the optic chiasm. Well, we can all make the diagnosis that this is just a classic macroadenoma. So this waste of the macroadenoma is felt to be due to extension superiorly through the diaphragma cella. And when it gets big enough, it can expand the cella. Now, again, <clears throat> a couple of things that I can say from my journey and from my experience is that some of these macroadenomas can present a little bit atypically. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the typical appearance because you know that better than I do. But what I will say is sometimes you can get fooled by some of these atypical growth patterns. So this was an example of an intraosseous macroadenoma that extended into the clivus. Notice how that clivus is expanded and it's high signal on T2. And again, if I saw this, I don't think macroadenoma would be the top of my list because in general, they tend to grow superiorly, not inferiorly. However, having said that, you can have macro, macroadenomas that involve the sphenoid sinus, as we saw before. So this is expansion of the cella growing into the sphenoid sinus. And we can have macroadenomas extending into the cavernous sinus. Now, the classification that I typically use is the CNOPS, K and OSP classification, such that if there's no involvement of the cavernous sinus, it's a NOP zero. 
If it's extending medially and you draw a line between the parallel planes of the ICA, if it's medial to that, it's a one. If it extends medially, but is still bordered by the lateral margin, it's a two. If it extends laterally, it's a three. And if it extends all the way to that lateral wall, and in case of the carotid artery, it's a four. And again, there are many classifications. I'd be kind of curious to see how, uh, if most of you use this classification or you just sort of look at it and just make your own determination prior to your section. But in general, MR is pretty good at looking at those classifications of, of grading these um, macroadenomas. And this is just another example, a very aggressive macroadenoma encasing the carotid artery, but lo and behold, this macro had noma, believe it or not, extended to involve the infratemporal fossa. And in this one, this macro had noma extended all the way intracranially. So you can have a lot of atypical appearances for the growth patterns of macro had nomas. Now, here's an example of a mass that's involving the cella and supercellar cistern. And this is a non-contrast T1 weighted image. And the way we can suggest this diagnosis is the fact that we can see that this mass has high T1 signal on the non-contrast images. So we, if we do have a predominantly supercellar mass in this location, then we can suggest a diagnosis of that craniopharyngioma. Now we know the craniopharyngiomas are arising from Rathke's pouch, and I'll just really focus in this talk on why it's high T1 signal, because this can help us make that diagnosis. And the reason is, is because it contains that proteinaceous material. It's almost described as crankcase oil. And this gives us that high T1 signal that can help us on MR make the diagnosis of craniopharyngiomas. We can also have the characteristic findings seen on CT. If you see fluid and if you see calcifications, again, you can suggest the diagnosis of craniopharyngioma as is seen here. On MR, you can have fat, and you can have calcifications, and you can have fluid. But remember, anytime that you see fat, you also have to include the possibility of a teratoma. So remember, cranios can occasionally contain fat. More commonly, they contain calcifications. But realize when you do see the calcifications and you do see the fat, you always have to consider teratoma slash dermoid in addition to craniopharyngiomas. Now, these are a little bit more uh, unusual examples of craniopharyngiomas. I know all of you have seen lots of craniopharyngiomas. I'll just find, show you a few atypical examples. This was a large, uh, a large craniopharyngioma involving the skull base. You can see it's actually encasing the uh, M1, the A1, and the M1 segments of the internal carotid artery. And this was an example of an ectopic craniopharyngioma. So remember, cranio for us, uh, remember the uh, anterior pituitary arises from the oral stomodium, which is a precursor of the oral pharynx. It tends to get pulled up through this craniopharyngeal canal where it forms the anterior portion of the pituitary gland. But for some reason, if it's not elevated through the craniopharyngeal canal, you can actually have ectopic pituitary tissue or ectopic, in a way, craniopharyngiomas that can arise in the posterior aspect of the oral cavity. And again, due to this persistent canal right here, this craniopharyngeal canal. So in the back of your mind, these are some things to always consider if you have these children that present with these atypical masses. Now, this is that case that I showed earlier. So this was a, a patient, and I remember this is where I've sort of gone down the tubes, but like I said, you know, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So I've been burned on this a couple of times, but I just didn't think of it, but I finally figured out how I can suggest that diagnosis. So here's an example of a patient that presents with an aggressive mass involving the, 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 the central skull base. And you can see it's expansile, it's very solid. And you can say, hey, you know, this looks like, this looks like a classic metastasis or maybe it's a chordoma or so on and so forth. But when I'm dealing with, an, an, again, an elderly man, I said it myself, of my age, notice how the T2 signal is very low. It's not very bright. So when I think of this, when I've seen this, now all of a sudden in my mind, it triggers that I have to think of plasma cytoma. So plasma cytomas are tumors of plasma origin. Again, more common in male than female. Again, there's that middle age group. I hate giving this talk because I'm like at risk for all these crazy tumors. But realize that the pathology is identical to multiple myeloma 
but instead it forms a dis discrete mass. And this is this classification of plasma cytoma, solitary plasma cytoma of bone, extramedullary sol solitary uh, extramedullary plasma cytoma, or you could have multiple solitary lesions. And in general, the nice thing about this is that the treatment is good. It get, the prognosis is good because they're treated with radiation therapy. Now, I do want to emphasize this. I think I've got about maybe um, nearing about 10 minutes left. Is that right? I think you told me about an hour. Is that yeah. right? Yes, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, I do want to emphasize this because, you know, this is one of these things where, and again, I'm dealing with a, a global group of, I mean, literally world-class neurosurgeons. And one of the things that I'm always worried about the skull base is that you look at patients that present with a sixth nerve palsy or seventh nerve palsy, and I just see regular brain MRIs. And my point is that if you are dealing with a patient that has a specific cranial nerve palsy, you know, work with your, with your wonderful neurosurgical or your radiology colleagues in order to do really thin section imaging. Because here's a patient that presents with a six nerve palsy. And I remember this, this was the middle of the night. And, and the thing that kind of struck me in the middle of the night, everything looks the same. But what struck me is that when I looked at this, there was abnormal signal here involving the clivus. And this was a skull base somewhere. And if you look at that abnormal signal, just realize the sixth nerve runs from the floor of the fourth ventricle, courses anteriorly at the pontomedullary junction. It has a cisternal segment, and then it courses anteriorly through Dorella's canal. So when it's at Dorella's canal, realize that anything that involves the clivus can give you a sixth nerve palsy. Similarly, this was a patient that had a seventh nerve palsy. And so if you have the seventh nerve, you always have to remember the anatomy. So you have the cisternal segment of the seventh nerve, then you have this labyrinthine segment, you have the anterior genu and the tympanic segment, you have the geniculate ganglion, and then you have the greater superficial petrosal nerve. And if you don't do the thin section imaging, here's this mass right here, but notice how here's a labyrinthine segment of the seventh nerve and there's a geniculate ganglion. And the reason this patient ended up having a seventh nerve palsy is that both of these patients had lymphoma. So in this case, the pathology is not necessarily important, but what's important is that if you have patients that do have isolated cranial nerve palsies, you know, make sure you do your thin section imaging. Another example here, a patient with the sixth nerve palsy, we can see a metastasis involving the clivus. And this was a patient that ended up having a six nerve palsy. And we can see that there's actually erosion here of the lateral aspect of the clivus. And if, you're, if you love the skull base like I do, this was Dorella's canal. So you have the medial portion of the petrous bone. You have the lateral aspect of the clivus. This is the uh, petrous sphenoid ligament, also known as Gruber's ligament. And right below it runs the sixth nerve. So anytime that you have diseases involving the clivus or involving the petrous apex, you can end up having that six nerve palsy. And there's no way you're gonna be doing it by performing just a standard brain MR. Similarly, a patient has a 12th nerve palsy, we can see replacement of the normal clivus and just lateral to that clivus is gonna be the canal for the 12th nerve. So the 12th nerve runs through the hypoglossal canal. We tend to call this the eagle's beak because on the coronal imaging, there's that 12th nerve. So anytime that you have a patient with a 12th nerve palsy, make sure you take a look at the clivus. And then finally, in patients with chronic 12th nerve palsies, you can also see atrophy of the tongue. So if you do have these patients that come in and you're not sure, remember to look at the skull base, specifically look at the central skull base, and then for 12th nerve palsies, just look at that tongue. So let me do this. I'm gonna go past here just because I'm running out of time, um, but I did wanna focus on uh, just two last points. And that is um, when you do have patients that have uh, dysplasias involved in the skull base, this is the classic example here of fibrous dysplasia. So I don't need to spend a lot of time going over fibrous dysplasia. I think you're all aware of this. But the point that I wanna make is that sometimes um, when you're looking at patients and they come in with these ill-defined findings, you'll see something that looks like this. And you'll say, what in the world is this? Here's this diffuse aggressive skull base mass. And what is this? Is this an aggressive tumor? Is it a bad infection? So on and so forth. And it's kind of a joke. If you ask a radiologist, sometimes you, I've heard the jokes all the time. Well, the radiologist just wants you to order another study. But just realize, especially when it gets into the skull base, CT and MR are complementary. So if you see something like this, 
just get a CT sometimes. And what you'll see is that this patient has diffuse fibrous dysplasia involving the skull base. And all of this stuff on MR can be really fool you. And now all this is is really extensive fibrous dysplasia. Another thing that kind of confused you is this. So when, if you look at the central skull base, and sometimes you'll have these patients with these weird symptoms, you'll see this type of appearance. You'll sort of see the cystic sclerotic appearance involved in the central skull base. And you'll say, is this a chordoma? Is it um, a metastases? So on and so forth. And what kind of tips you off? Again, this is where MR can be helpful. Because if you perform your MR and you see something like this and you've seen enough, what this is, is arrested pneumatization or incomplete pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. Now, granted, sometimes you can't be 100%, but if you are dealing with an experienced skull-based radiologist, you can see that the cortex of this bone is actually pretty well intact. And then on the non-contrast T1-weighted images, we can see these focal areas of fat. And on the T2-weighted images, you can sort of see this bubbly kind of appearance, but that is true fluid. So this is one, one example of incomplete pneumatization. And here's another example. On the sagittal images, you can see that you can have a partial of this precellar pneumatization of the, of the clivus. But when you look posteriorly, you can see this fluid. And on the T1-weighted images, you can see that there's incomplete pneumatization right at the margin of the air and the clivus you can see this fat. And again, that's indicative of incomplete pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. So I'm sure you're dealing a lot with this. Sometimes you don't know what to do. If you're ever not sure, just get a repeat imaging, especially as a CT or an MR in three to six months, and then you'll be able to confirm that stability. And then finally, I just want to go over uh, this last... Dr. Mukherjee, yeah. we, we aren't seeing the slides at the moment. Oh, you're we, not? We are just uh, kind of... Uh, on the on the slide with that uh, oh. fibrous fibrous dysplasia, yeah, the four. Oh, sorry about that. Did you did you, uh, you can you see it now? Uh, I can't. I don't know. The okay. Others. Let me do this then. I don't know what. Let me do a stop share and then let me reshare then. How about right. that? Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Sorry about that. No problem. Apologies for that. No. Let me do okay. a share. Okay. Let me if you, if you see that. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks for pointing that out. And I'll just stand with this because I know I'm out of time. Uh, we're almost out of time. So I just want to point this out to you. So uh, again, I think uh, if you see something like this, we've talked a lot about chordomas and chondrosarcomas, and we're talking about lateral and paracellar masses. And you see this mass here that's a little bit calcified. You know, in the back of your mind, you always have to think about aneurysms. So I did want to talk about just sort of this variable appearance with aneurysm, because certainly you don't want to, to miss anything like that. So you can have these paracellar masses that can expand the, the, uh, the, the central skull base. You can see the various calcifications. And these are felt to directly arise from branches of the ICA. They can be congenital or post-traumatic. And when they arise from the central skull base, they tend to be laterally directed. So this is just a coronal CTA just demonstrating the lateral direction. And this is just an example here demonstrating that bone erosion that can be associated with these central skull base aneurysms. And here you can see expansion of the lateral aspect of the cella. This was just an unusual aneurysm arising from the paracellar region. This was arising from the persistent trigeminal artery. And then finally, one, uh, two last cases. This is, looks like a dense mass right here. Is this a glioma or a pituitary uh, uh, DIPG arising from the pons? No, this was just a big aneurysm, a partially thrombosed aneurysm. And you can see this enlarged basilar artery that's associated with that aneurysm. But realize these appearances can be very confusing. So in the back of your mind, you always have to think about it. And my last case right here, we talked about aneurysms but I'm sure all of you are doing MRAs to work up aneurysms or CTAs. Just realize that if you do see something like this that looks like a giant aneurysm, make sure you work with your radiologist, go over the source images for these aneurysms and also look at the remainder of the study because this was not an aneurysm. What this was was just a mucosal involving the less sphenoid sinus. So in this central skull base area, you have to think of aneurysms, but you also have to consider the mimics. So Naren, with that, I'll stop. I think I'm right on time. So what we've done over the last hour or so is that we really focus on the central skull base. We talked a lot about the anatomy. 
We talked a lot about the neural foramen. We talked of a variety of neoplasms. We talked about dysplasias, a few congenital lesions. And my last two take home messages are number one, if you're going to look at thin structures and thin nerves, make sure you do thin section imaging. And number two, you know, we as radiologists, we are your partners. And again, I was de delighted that, um, that Naren asked me to give uh, this talk on imaging to this wonderful group. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, for the masterful uh, lecture in the anatomy and pathology of central skull base. Uh, just to let you know that uh, this is one of those lectures where, if anything, all the audience were there, and if anything, they were going up. So you certainly captivated the participants. Thank you very much. Um, I've got uh, uh, two questions. Then there are a uh, number of uh, senior. Uh, colleague that I know, so I'll ask them to make any comments. One, the one is a question from uh, um, Dr. I'll just uh, get that question. Um, and Dr. Uh, Chandru uh, Kali Perumal. Can I guess Dr. Kali Perumal to ask the question? Um, Chandru, do you want to ask the question? Uh, yes, hi, thanks, Naren. Can, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Prof. Mukherjee. I mean, it was fascinating. I, I love the way you started off. Uh, you know, I, I just passed out a comment saying, you know, we, we called it central skull base as a religious bone. <laughs> we used to call it a holy bone. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful. I mean, I, I love the whole one hour just pass, went past like so, so swiftly. Now, my question for you is, um, I, I deal with skull base. Um, I, I'm not an expert, but you know, I deal with part of the, the whole skull, skull base pathology, including trigeminal neuralgias. Now, augmented, re augmented reality, virtual reality, haptic simulation, it's slowly taking over. Uh, uh, you know, um, when we talk about teaching training and also about simulation prior to. Uh, you know, uh, uh, surgical intervention. Now, I just want to know what your experience, are you now uh, for your residents, uh, do you routinely use virtual uh, augmented reality for teaching purposes? And what do you think the future will be? Uh, thank you, that's yeah. my question. No, I think it's a great, we, we don't use it. I think, um, <clears throat> I think the augmented reality is, is very interesting. I, I think it's a great thought. I never thought about it for augmented reality for trigeminal neurologists. I think what is important before you start doing uh, the augmented reality is to make sure that the, the data that you're actually generating the augmented reality is really good data. So what I mean by that, when I mean the data, I'm talking about the input of the, the, of the, the imaging that you're using. So at least for us, for trigeminal neuralgias, and again, I've been, <clears throat> I've, I still remember before we were doing heavily T2 weighted images, and then we started to use the cis sequences, and then we started using fiestas and all sorts of acronyms. Um, and, and initially, I wasn't a, a huge fan of, of trigeminal neuralgias uh, with the heavily T2 weighted images, but overall, I've converted. Um, but the two lessons that I will say is that number one, oftentimes there are a lot of neurovascular conflicts that you see that are um, in, in asymptomatic patients. So number two is that if you are going to be inputting the data, make sure that the sequences that you're using, the KISS, the FIESSES, et cetera, are really, really of high quality. Because if you're starting to do VR and augmented reality and you sort of are using, you know, whatever um, um, components that you're using, just make sure that data is really good. I think once you have really good data, then you have to determine what data you're putting in. So not only the heavily T2 weighted images, but some people use the, the contrast enhanced thin section gradient echo sequences, because that way you can actually fuse the gradient echo sequences with the heavily T2 weighted images. So I think what you're doing is great. We tend, we haven't done it, but if you are gonna do it, just make sure that the data that you're using is good. And if you are gonna be fusing um, T1 um, bright blood techniques with T2, Make sure that that fusion is 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 um, very accurate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Dr. Kiwi Kima. Um, it's regarding uh, extraosseous chordoma. Uh, he's um, relating to the spinal chordomas. And um, uh, is there chordomas in spine? Are they, in terms of radiologically, very similar to the uh, 
central skull base chordomas uh, in terms of MRI CT findings? Yeah, they are similar in the sense that, it, so the classic chordomas are gonna be high signal on T2, um, low signal on T1 and enhanced with contrast. And yeah, they, they tend to be, I think even more important is that, again, you can have a variety of pathologies sort of have a similar appearance, um, especially when you get down to the sacrum. Um, again, it's one of these things that you have to think about because chordomas are, are kind of rare. But in the back of your mind, if you just remember chordomas are high T2 signal, low signal on T1, high signal on T2, and then you actually see it arising from the distal aspect of the sacrum, you know, that's the thing that really, that really tips you off. But in general, the, um, they, they tend to be similar. Now, having said that, realize that not all chordomas are high signal on T2s because there are a variety of histologic variants of, of chordomas. So what I've told you is the, the classical the classical appearance to it with the understanding that that T2 signal can be variable. It's very similar to pleomorphic adenomas involving the parotid gland. Sometimes the classic pleomorphic adenomas are high T2 signal, but based on whether they contain calcifications or not, it can give you that variation. Thank you. Um, we have a Dr. Uh, Deepu Banerjee uh, from India. Um, Dr. Banerjee, um, do you have any comments, questions for Dr. Mukherjee? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And uh, what I would appreciate is that uh, anatomy with uh, radiology and the correlation of some of the tumors are very, very excellent. I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, if it is, uh, I mean, of course, not in this talk, but sometimes the skull based lesions erode the pia barrier of the brainstem and other structures. So some of the radiological features which uh, can kind of highlight those where we know that the, uh, the barrier is, pile barrier is broken and it is invading the, uh, the neural structures. Yeah, that's great. Uh, welcome from India. I actually got, I get I to India you. maybe every two years or so. I was just oh, in Bangalore for the, for the national meeting. Um, so it's, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I do actually have slides of that in a different talk on the anterior skull base. Um, and specifically with the anterior skull base, when we talk about different types of intracranial involvement, so, um, you know, one thing that I try to emphasize to my radiology colleagues is, um, I, I don't really mention it, but I've been the radiologist on the AJCC staging system back since the fifth edition. Right. So, um, so now we're on the eighth edition. Um, and um, the, when we do talk about staging, um, they talk about intracranial involvement, but there are different degrees of intracranial involvement. So there's erosion of the inner cortex of the skull, there's involvement of the dura, and there's peel invasion. So in general, um, when, we, when we do say there's peel invasion, this is really for non-meningiomas. Um, if you do have either squamous cell carcinomas or other tumors, and it is associated with vasogenic edema, in general, as a rule of thumb, that typically indicates peel involvement. Now, I know in meningiomas, especially in younger patients, uh, certainly not my age, but younger patients that don't have as much atrophy as I do, um, if you do have meningiomas, they tend to um, elicit vasogenic edema without evidence, of, uh, without evidence of brain invasion. So I think that's the one um, potential um, variant. So um, in general, if you do have vasogenic edema, that for me has been the most um, reliable sign that there's, there's, there's actually peel involvement. Especially for uh, chordomas, mostly it is an extradural tumor, but it sometimes breaches the dura. Then uh, the surgery becomes a little tough because uh, okay. once it is breaches, it can expand any intracranially very rapidly. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Thank you. Oh, thank my you. pleasure. And uh, Dr. Professor Maurizio Aikunanjali, do you have any questions for, or comments for uh, Dr. Mukherjee? Thanks. Um, Dr. Mukherjee, while uh, on the thanks to Professor Aikunanjali, thanks. Hi, Nene. Hello. <laughs> it, it's a Sunday, so I, I was. Uh... Uh, eating uh, while uh, I watching the presentation, the beautiful presentation. <laughs> we just finished, it, so it was really interesting uh, for us, uh, for uh, our resident uh, that are at home uh, watching the your presentation. Uh, really ex explicative and uh, 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 fully didactic. Thank you, really. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah. Aaron, 
Dr. Um, Mukherjee, I have got a comment and then a question. Comment is that, uh, you know, whenever skull-based surgeons uh, see a, a unusual skull-based lesion, uh, you know, they do get excited. And uh, I had a, a two cases of um, um, pediatric patients around nine, 10 years. And uh, one was, a, both of them were cavernous sinus uh, lesions. And uh, first patient, we did a beautiful um, dolence approach. Uh, and uh, then the patient was just being turned and the anesthetist was on the other side and was holding, the, catching the patient as we turned back. And then she felt lumps in the tummy. And uh, so, you know, basically the patient had metastatic kind of lymphoma and we said, and I was a resident at the time, certainly we jumped to the cavernous sinus and you know, we couldn't wait to do the Dolan's approach. So always uh, have a look to see when, whenever there's a skull-based lesion, there's nothing elsewhere. Don't get seduced by the, uh, the lesion. The second one was, I was um, then a consultant uh, up north and um, my colleague had again a cavernous sinus lesion. He was absolutely excited and he wanted to do Dolan's approach and said, Naren, I'm doing Dolan's approach tomorrow. And I said, well, you ain't going to do a Dolan's approach. Have you examined the rest of the body? And uh, lo and behold, when they examined, he had lymph, uh, lymph nodes in the armpit and uh, lesions in the uh, liver and abdomen as well. So just one piece of advice is uh, always uh, look to see where something, whether there's something else somewhere um, and that you know sometimes uh, you know uh, avoids you doing a big operation my other question is uh, my question is this uh, you, you know radiology for a neurosurgeon uh, is a pattern recognition obviously for you it's a uh, amazing art and um, in terms of would is it coming very soon or is it already there that in neuroradiology you will get artificial intelligence that is help you know, helps um, uh, neuroradiologists to verify or to make sure that they haven't missed something. Uh, where are we in that technology? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I actually have a specific talk on this and a couple of talks, especially regarding sort of sort of the challenges. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Gartner curve, but the Gartner curve is a it's a business curve, and you've probably seen it already. It may have been on one of your posts, but. Um, in, uh, in AI, especially for radiology, we're sort of past the peak of heightened in, in expectations and we're sort of on the, the downturn. So <clears throat> when it comes to, um, there are different types of AI, there's sort of a, a CAD-E and a CAD-DX. So the, the CAD-E is more um, initial detection, whether it's normal or abnormal. So I kind of call it the virtual resident approach. So if I'm reading out with a resident and the resident says there's something abnormal, well, that's, that makes me look at it a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think um, the specific areas where this, this CAD-E is helpful, I think are things such as, I think brain hemorrhage is, is good, certainly stroke. I mean, I think, uh, and quite frankly, now to go, go a little bit off script, you know, the things like Viz AI and, and Rapid, Ischemia View, and all these other ones were actually started before the era of artificial intelligence. So they sort of got their AI post hoc because all that that information was actually there before, but it's sort of now in the, the realm of AI. Um, but when we talk about the CAD DX, and we actually talk about lesion classifications, so if you do see a heterogeneous mass involving the brain, is it going to be tumor? Is it going to be infection? Is it going to be um, is it going to be an, a, an inflammatory process? Um, if it is a tumor, what kind of tumor? I don't think we're ever going to get to that level. But as far as basic things are concerned, hemorrhage, no hemorrhage, stroke, I think is great, then yes. Um, I think what we are seeing in general when it comes to artificial intelligence is that I think um, this myth that we don't need, there are too many radiologists has been debunked. In, in general, I don't know about the UK or other parts of the world, there's a shortage of radiologists. And I think where AI is gonna make a real difference is through high, high output screening. So for instance, if you are doing lung cancer screening, I'm not sure, I think you have that in the UK and other parts of the world. If you have breast screening, prostate, especially for men, that's now basically the breast cancer for men, if you will. And, <clears throat> and even dementia, I think in dementia, as you get older, um, those are in a way low hanging fruit where you want to see, is there something abnormal or is there not? Um, I think there's a lot of tailwind for that to, to integrate screenings, yes or no. So I think that's going to be a, a major win for 
AI, and that's just high output screening studies. But as far as true lesion classifications, um, I'm a little circumspect that that's um, going to um, catch hold. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a small comment for my neurosurgical colleagues that are, I find it useful. When I was a junior, one of the radiologists told me that um, you know, uh, when he looks at a chest X-ray, although it's two-dimensional, he tries to imagine that it's three-dimensional and then look at it and then he can see things. And I, I find that useful, that analogy useful when I'm looking at the um, CT or MRI of the head. As I go through the slices, I go from uh, systematically from, you know, either from top to bottom or bottom to top. And uh, as a surgeon, I just, in my mind, I, I see the patient in my eyes view and I see this uh, scan and I, in my mind, I kind of fuse the patient and the scans as I move through. And I find it very, very useful uh, when I'm operating or try to get an understanding of, um, of the pathology in relation to the patient. Uh, so you know, whenever you see a two-dimensional image, try to see it um, you know, either because of the lots of images or try to see it as a three-dimensional image. I don't know what's your insight, any advice for neurosurgeons as we look at scans, Dr. Mukherjee? No, I think it's great. And in fact, I, I take, unfortunately, I took the opposite approach because when I trained in my, the first half of my career, <clears throat> all we had were axial images. So in a way I had to manipulate it mentally to come up with a 3D image. So actually I had a harder time accepting the sagittal and the coronal. So I have to force myself to look at these because in my own mind, I'm actually looking at these. But I think what you say is a very true. I know from imaging, um, they're, they're, numerous softwares that are out there that can help you look you know, in, in various three dimensions. And some people do use the, um, the 3D printing to help out. I think that's especially helpful in, in patients with cranial synostosis and um, other uh, craniofacial malformations. Um, I know uh, back when I was at University of North Carolina, we were doing sort of on at this, this was long before the days of really NVIDIA chips and things like that. We were doing, um, 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 uh, pl uh, planning, so almost virtual surgery where you try to, we would take the data, uh, reconstruct it, then we try to remove the skull, see the tumor, so on and so forth. So that's been around for, for 30 years. It's only gotten better. So yeah, I think com use, use whatever tools we have, because there's a lot of them to, to help you with your surgical approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, if there's any other questions that you want to put to Dr. Mukherjee, please uh, there, email there, me. I'm happy to. Yeah, there, was, there was one question that was sent to me by Ranjit Kaur. He said, how do we determine if the nerve is compressed or infiltrated by tumor? Oh, uh, could you, I, I think that's a good <clears throat> yeah. question. <clears throat> yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so I just, it, it's a wonderful question because there's, there's a couple of, there's one principle that probably needs to be brought out when we do talk about peri when we talk about nerve, we'll call it, call it nerve involvement. There's a, a, a difference between compression, perineural invasion, and perineural spread. So perineural invasion is, is actually a histologic diagnosis. So that's where the, histology, the, the pathologist looks in and he can actually see the perineurium or the epineurium actually involved by tumor. Um, and that those are typically of unnamed nerves. Perineural spread is macroscopic spread along a named nerve. So that is something that we can see on imaging. And it, it's characterized by <clears throat> expansion of the nerve and diffuse involvement of the nerve itself, of a named nerve. So what I showed when I showed the, it wasn't really true perineural spread. When I, when I did show the involvement of the schwannomas and nerve fibromas, that was actually real involvement of the nerve itself. So you can think of that as like a pseudo uh, perineural spread. And the compression, I think if, if you can see tumor and it kind of abuts the nerve, but you do really, really good imaging and you don't see that nerve enhancing or expanded, then that's more suggestive of compression of the nerve. So it was a good question um, and it does make the, give the opportunity to talk about compression versus perineural invasion versus perineural spread because they're distinct differences between those three scenarios. That's, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mugati, once again for fielding all those questions.
and for this great lecture. And I hope that um, this is just the beginning of uh, a, a collaborative effort between neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists that we hope we can both grow it, I think, because all the specialties, there's a big cross-sectional area that we can both learn from each other greatly from a joint meeting, which in the old days it was difficult to organize, but now with the webinars, probably they are more feasible. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, um, matter is that the lecture is recorded. It's on the YouTube. I will send you the link. It, it will be there for you to uh, everyone to review and go through it. Um, so thank you very much again, Dr. Fresh Mukherjee for taking the time and taking us through and this complex area of radiology that we neuroscience have to have a good understanding to do our, our, our job well. And thank you to uh, Dr. Vidya Param Jain who helped me in organizing this meeting um, and also to all the participants uh, who joined us. Thank you very much and see you all soon. Thank you, Naren. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, cheers. Time. Leave me. <laughs>